All right. Chapter 22 of Revelation. The Lamb has overcome. We're going to conclude tonight. Oh, thank you, Wayne. Uh, got worksheets up here for the study tonight. This will be the last lesson on Revelation. Uh, one other thing I'm going to make you aware of, what I'm praying about. One of the things in our church, I don't know if you've seen in those chandeliers that hang up in the ceiling up there. Several of them have a lot of burned out bulbs that we're not able to replace or anything. And that is a very, very uh, non-energy efficient light system that we have. And if you, I know when I first came here, I kept saying, are you sure the lights are turned all the way up? Because it just seemed real dark in there to me for as many lights as we have. So we're looking at trying to change. We don't want to wait till we get all our dead stuff paid off. We want to change light fixtures in there. And when we go to an LED light, a two by four LED light, we're going to take. We want to take those lights, those the chandelier lights down, and put an LED two by four light up in the ceiling grid like this. And we'll have a lot more light. Dimmable. They're dimmable and everything. And uh, here's the deal: they're 95, about 95 dollars a piece. And we can change the bulbs out in them if they go out. We're going to have twice the light we have now at least. And it probably half the cost. Half the electricity cost. Because of let those, those in that may less than half probably electricity. Oh, one ounce piece. Yeah. So it will be a lot more efficient on us and save us money in the long term. There's 15 chandeliers in there. We're going to change them out. We want to take them out with 15 of these in place of them. Well, that's what we're, I don't agree to pay for one. If you'll think about it, and if you'd like to see it a little bit more, and several people don't come and they'd buy one, but if 15 people agree to buy one, we'll go in there and change them things out. Yeah. We don't have the money right now to do it. We're going to put the chandeliers up for sale. They yeah, we're looking at, if some of you maybe want to get one of the chandeliers or something, because we are thinking about selling those chandeliers, because we, another thing we, we are hoping to do is put a, uh, we need a new sound system back there. The one we've got is an old analog sound system, if you don't know that. And it can, we have some things that sometimes it blinks out on us. We have some problems with it. It gets static in it. We want to change it out. Ricky Wagner, Wagner has found us one. It's about $4,000. It's digital, though. We can set it, and it stays. So you can't go in there and mess it up like the one we've got now. And it'll just give us a lot better sound in the sanctuary. And so anyway, that's something we want to do. We thought we might sell the chandeliers so people would buy them and then take that money and apply it toward the new sound system, you know, put it on the new sound system. So just think about it. Mainly we just want to avoid trying to go out and spend If we bought all these, 15 of these right now, we'd be looking at, you know, a little $1,500 for those. The, right now we've got a problem with one of the transformers in it that's going to be several hundred dollars yeah. just to change that one and that's part of the reason the lights are flickering and everything else on that set. Yeah, there are some issues with it. It's not just, it's too expensive. We've got some parts going out that's going to cost us a lot of money to fix. And so we thought, hey, if we have 15 people that's only one light, we're going there and solve that problem right now. So if you want more information about it, these sheets are up here. You can pick up a sheet and find out a little more about it. Okay? Um, uh, so if you're interested, let us know, or you can just put a check in Sunday and say for a new light. Whatever. We'll keep it separate for that purpose. That's right? Yes, ma'am, it probably doesn't include. I don't know if that includes no tax for that. So it's probably more rounded off close to hundred dollars. But hey, if we get if everybody gives ninety five, we'll pay the tax. <laughs> we'll be glad to pay the tax on that. All right? I suppose to have a sample within the next few days. Okay. Yeah, Wayne's going to try to get a sample light that we can bring Sunday if you might feel like you want to look at. They're similar to these lights, but they're going to put out a lot more light than these are and even more energy efficient than these lights are. All right, chapter 22 of Revelation. If you want to turn there, we're on verse 6. So we'll be looking at verse 6 down through verse 21 tonight. We're going to conclude this. By the way, we're going to start back teaching next Wednesday night. In fact, he's going to take several of the Wednesday nights until, so because I'm going to start, he's going to teach on Wednesdays while I'm doing the January Bible study on Sunday nights. And so uh, I appreciate him taking, so I don't have to prepare for Sunday nights and do the January Bible study too. I'm sorry? Winter Bible study. Winter Bible study. That's what they call it now. That's what I was going to ask. I was like, January of what year? <laughs> They used to they call it January Bible study, and I'm just I'm just a used to her, I guess. But uh, they changed it a few years ago to winter. Yeah. 
sure to tell them about the time. Time for the winter. January, I mean, winter ball day starts at 5. Starts at 5 o'clock. What we do is I teach for about 45 minutes. We have a snack break. Everybody brings finger foods. and So we have snacks and stuff. And then we go back and I teach for another 45 minutes, okay? And we meet here in the fellowship hall. We do the classes in here. Go over there and have our snack time. Okay? Very good. Here we go. Sunday night. That starts on the 23rd. Sunday night, the 23rd. So that will be what? Two weeks from this coming Sunday night. We'll start that. And as soon as that's over, we're going to start. A, we're going to do a class for six Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. And it's going to be men and women separated. And the women are going to study the Bible and the men are going to talk about the women. So <laughs> that's the root of all our problems. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to get into that. All right. No, uh, we're going to have a men's and a women's Bible study for six weeks at 5 o'clock. So that'll just be one hour. It won't be two hours. All right. <laughs> Okay, the faithful word of God. That's the first thing we're talking about tonight. It's verses 6 through 10. I'm going to read that. And when you get down to this last chapter, you see you're reminded that this is a book of uh, with a promise. It says if you read this book and you keep this book, God promised a blessing to you. That's back in chapter 1 and verse 3. And so here John gives kind of the last word. That's how the book began. And now it ends... Uh, the last words of Jesus before, what I guess it would be fair to say, has now been 2,000 years of silence. Uh, God has said it all. He concluded it all. And these are some of the three final thoughts that, that the Bible gives us here tonight. The three final thoughts. And the first one is the faithful word of God, verses 6 through 10. Let me read it. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me all these things. And then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and your brethren and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Well, that's verse 11. Let me hold up and I'll come back to that. The first thing we see in verse 6 is the accuracy of the word of God. Here we see kind of a conclusion, if you will. This is the last book. Not only last because it's at the end of the Bible, but it's as far as we can tell, it's the last book that was written. The last book of the Bible, date-wise, time-wise. It was written again, if you don't remember, it was written somewhere around 90 A.D. One of the last, uh, the last book that was written. And when he says the words of faithful and true, obviously he is referencing the Revelation, the last book. But I think it's a fair statement because we know the Word of God has also been called faithful and true. And Jesus, the living Word of God, is referred to when He comes back on the white horse as the one who is faithful and true. And so and He is the living Word. This is the written Word of God. And so, it, yeah, it's a reference to the book of Revelation, but it's also a reference, I think, to all of the Word of God. And so uh, here we see the accuracy, the importance of the accuracy of the Word of God. And uh, I don't know what you believe, but I believe that you can stand on the Word of God. Amen. I don't believe that it could be an anchor for your soul if it wasn't solid and unchangeable. Uh, the Word of God is called true. It's called perfect, actually, three different times in the Scripture. And so we're reminded of the validity and the power. Uh, we know that it says the Word of God cuts the... As a two-edged sword of truth, it cuts through the dividing the, the soul and spirit. And we know the Bible is, itself speaks of itself as being the, I believe, the term as I like to use is that inerrant and infallible Word of God. And friends, I want you to know that 
in this day and time, that is that is so under attack. The Word of God. I'm telling you, we. I'm preparing my sermon for Sunday morning, and I've been working on that this week. And and the study, the the last one of those religions we're kind of looking at Sunday morning covers several different types of religions, but it's it's the New Age movement and the occult. And uh, we're going to tie into some things. I saw a video this week that I some things that I didn't catch, but there was a lot of things. Been a lot of talk about that halftime show at the Super Bowl <laughs> last Sunday night. And, and I, I caught bits and pieces of it because I had to record it and I just ran through it, but I saw bits and pieces of it. I didn't really think about any symbolic meaning, but man, somebody had taken everything from the uniforms of those dancers to the symbols that they made behind their head as, and tied it all right into the, the goat's head. Tied it all symbols of motions that they made with their hands, exactly how they had their hands. She, J-Lo, had her hands placed. There was so much satanic stuff. You may have seen it on the stage. There was a circle that had a cross on that circle with some little wings on it. That's a symbol of Satanism. It's one of the prime symbols of Satanism. The little children on there that were in cages. They were in cages and some of them had their hands tied together. Well, you know what the thing was this week? The big push, the uh, influential thing that they were talking about a lot last weekend was human trafficking. And it's almost like God saying, I'm trying to stop human trafficking, and they go out there at the Super Bowl and celebrate it. Right. Celebrate the opposite of it, maybe I should say. Have you seen any uh, Luminati's references to the... That was with Beyonce a couple of years ago. It was really big on some of that stuff, the triangle stuff, her holding the triangle oh, and all that kind of stuff. So There's a lot of Satanism involved in stuff. And, you know, and I'll be honest, we're probably pretty oblivious to it, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, their uniforms have a, are outlined like a goat's head that they had on with the horns, which is the number one probably satanic symbol. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that if you're not careful, if you're not really alert to it, like I wasn't, that will will wake you up. I mean, there was so much symbol, and, and I saw just a little five minute video on it. Uh, and, and, and it's, uh, but it's amazing some of the things that, that goes on around us, and, and it all goes back, you remember in the Garden of Eden, what did the devil do? What was the very first temptation he used against Adam and Eve? That God's word is not true. God's word is not true. Well, here in the end of the Bible, we're still God is still making that statement. I'm true. I can be trusted. My word can be trusted. And the devil's always tried to cause you to doubt the word of God. And that's what's happening with a lot of this younger millennial generation today. They just don't believe God. They don't believe. A lot of them don't believe that homosexuality is wrong. They don't care what God says. They don't, they don't care what God says. And that's our culture today. And God says it's wrong. But I hear a lot that in Methodists is splitting because of the... Yes, I am. You're right. That's the whole point. There are churches that's not sure it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. There's churches that doubt the accuracy of the Word of God. Uh, I remember talking to them. Yeah. I, I could just take all mine and give you a lot of examples of that, but, but I won't. Uh, so here we see the challenge to the Word of God. And we know that we're safe. Do you think that the Word of God is important? Here at the end of the Bible, it's driving that nail home again. That the Word of God is true. It's faithful. It's true. You can depend on it. Why is it important? Well, to me, one of the verses that stands out to me is 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at it real quick and we'll move on. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 25. Y'all turn in there or y'all just going to trust me? Trust me. Alright. Look what it says. But the word of God, the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. There's other verses in this very first chapter. Look at look back to verse 22 of that same chapter. Since you've been purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Look at this now, verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Do you realize that apart from the Word of God, I mean, you couldn't be saved. I mean, you're saved by believing the Word of God. That's why I don't believe a liberal is saved. I, I believe if you deny the Word of God, you can't be saved. Can't be. 
Because you don't have faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God. Right. So how can you be saved? See, if, if it's only valid in certain places, and you have to be inspired to find those places, then if one verse of it's wrong, then how do we know any of it's right? Who's going to tell us what parts of it's good and what parts is not good? Well, who's qualified to do that? Nobody. And so I just pull out some of those examples for you tonight. The accuracy of the Word of God. Number two, the authority of the Word of God. There back in Revelation, when it talks about the, the, the Word of God, it is, he says there that the Word has authority. Uh, and we need that authority because when we stand, you remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and he had to fight against the devil, what, what was his tool to fight with? The Word of God. The Word of God. He didn't say, well, I think. Or he didn't say, well, I read in the Reader's Digest this week. I saw it on he didn't say, I saw it on the Internet that he just said, God said it. God said it. And friends, when you're tempted and when you're, when you're in a low time in your life, you need to resort back to God said it. God said it. And so you stand on what God says. It says in verse 7, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words and prophecies of this book. <laughs> Coming quickly. The, he, the Greek word that's used there actually is a word that doesn't necessarily mean like I'm coming tomorrow. It means I'm going to come as a thief in the night. It means I'm going to come quickly on the scene. You're not going to have time to get ready. So that's what he's saying. He's not saying necessarily I'm coming tomorrow, but he's saying when I come, it's going to be, I'm going to break the eastern sky. You're going to hear the trumpet of God. And you better be ready when that time comes. Uh, he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Of course, we know that wasn't what he was supposed to do. And uh, you can imagine, though, I mean, if you're, if you're sitting here and an angel walks in and you see the glory of God, angels are referred to as heavenly beings. I mean, you might think, oh, I, this, this dude came from heaven. I need to get on my face. And that's what John did. And John's like, hey, you've been closer to God than I have. You know, and he said, no, no, get up, dude. You're going to get me and you both in trouble. I'm not the Lord. <laughs> I'm not the Lord. You get up and get up, and we'll talk about this thing. Uh, so, so here we see he's just telling them to, to keep and to heed these words. I think there's a lot of times we just learn these words, but we don't keep it. We don't heed it. We don't really do it. Remember James wrote about that and he said, don't just be hearers of the Word of God, be doers yeah. of the Word of God. It's one thing to know what you ought to do, it's another thing to do it. So uh, the steps to holy living are found here in verse 7. John here is so overwhelmed by the truth of what, he, of what he's seen, the truth of what he's seen, but also the fact that how this is going to impact the nations of the world. He is overwhelmed by the magnitude of the moment. And here's this angelic being. And uh, you can imagine, and, and particularly here, he's seen all the bad. He's just gone through seeing the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. He's gone through all this glorious stuff. It's the final, the final outcome of that. I was studying Jeremiah today, and Jeremiah... One thing Jeremiah did before they were taken away captive, they had sinned so much and they were fixing to be taken away captive to Babylon. But he had told them, he said, but there's good news. <laughs> he, he, all the way he said, first of all, I'm telling you guys, you need to repent. That's what he preached for a few years. And then they didn't repent. And he said, I got news for y'all. Think about repenting right now? It's too late. You're going to captivity. You're going to spend the next 70 years in Babylon. And, and here's what he did. Before they were taken captivity in Babylon, uh, Jeremiah went out and bought a cheap little a piece of property that wasn't worth nothing. You know why he bought that property? Because God had promised him when they come out of when they come out of Babylon, he's gonna bless them again. And he's gonna prosper everything that they have. And that was his way of telling the people, hey, God's gonna take you through some stuff, but it's gonna turn out all right. It's going to turn out because when we're there in Babylon, the people are going to get right. 
And we're going to come out and God's going to bless us. And so that's kind of what John is seeing here. John's seeing, hey man, God, I'm seeing some things. I've seen some horrible stuff, but man, God, God's going to do something great. And that's how he's kind of dealing with this, uh, the glory of God in the midst of all the glory stuff he had seen. In verse 9, this, uh, this angel again just reminds him that uh, he's just a messenger of God. Number three, part of this, the accessibility of the Word of God. The Word of God's not hidden from anybody, is it? It's just right there and it's available to all of us. It's available to all of us to, to come to God, to know God, to read of God. You know, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 4 through 9, in the book of Daniel, you may remember when Daniel and them got all those prophecies and things that God revealed to them, what did he tell Daniel to do with the things he had read? Anybody? He told Daniel, he said, seal it up. Take this book, seal it up. They're not ready for it. It's not for them to read right now. It was a prophecy about end time stuff. In fact, if you, you take your Revelation stuff and your Daniel stuff, there's a lot of it inter intermingles. A lot of Daniel's prophecies was about stuff of the second coming. One thing I told y'all once when we were taught, studying about Islam, there's things there where Daniel talks about the, the, uh, the uh, Greek uh, military under Alexander the Great, how it was going to be broken up into four different kingdoms, and, and uh, which one of those kingdoms was going to come back in the end, and, and, and the Seleucid kingdom was the one he said was going to come back and be a factor in the end of time. Well, guess who the Seleucid kingdom is? Turkey. <coughs> It's predominantly made up of the nation of Turkey. And if you're reading much about Turkey nowadays, it's Turkey who's, got, who's leading over there in the Muslim world. They're wanting to set up a caliphate. Uh, I don't know how that's going to happen, but they're thinking it's going to happen. They, they, the last Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Caliphate, Turkey led it. It was the Turkish flag. Caliphate, that is a world kingdom. That is a, that's where the Muslims run the world. It's their empire. And that's what they're wanting to set up as another world power. All the basically all the Muslim nations controlling everything. And they want to control. They believe they should run the world, just like the Ottoman Empire that was ended by World War One. And the, the the treaty at the end of World War One broke up that Ottoman Empire because they were on the losing side. And uh, Turkey couldn't be a military power for years, but now they've become one again. And a lot of people don't realize that Russia, the Bible tells us in the last day, Turkey and Russia and Iran are going to be part of these things. Well, man, Turkey and Russia and Iran's having lots of meetings today. A lot of people don't know that over 40% of the, the, the Russian, I guess, the Soviet Union, the Russian military today, over 40% is Muslim. From, from Tajikistan and all them. All them Kazakhstan's, a lot of the, a lot of them who come in there and then were, were became part of that military when it was the old Soviet Union. Do we still have missiles in Turkey? Do we have some over there? Yeah. Do we still have missiles? Uh, I don't even think they let us have a base there anymore. I'm not sure. We may still have one base in, in Turkey, but it, it's been a big part of that. Anyway, Daniel was saying when he wrote his prophecies, they were told to seal them up. And here John see here's of his prophecies and and. Uh, and he said, no, don't seal them up, man. I want you to write this. He tells him in verse 9 that, uh, see that you do that. Uh, he said to me, for I am your fellow servant. Oh, I'm sorry, am I reading the wrong one? Uh, Daniel telling John or John? Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel was just told by the Lord when he was writing his prophecies in the book of Daniel to seal it up. But John here, when he saw all that he saw, he was told to write it down. Where's the verse? Y'all help me with it. 10 and 11, I need to go a little further. Yeah, in verse 10, he told him, he said, Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Why does it say the time is at hand? It's been 2,000 years. Was the Bible just wrong here? When he said time is at hand. It's close. No? 2,000 years ago. Two days. You see, 2,000 years is something to us. What is that to God? Maybe two days? The Bible says a thousand years is like a day to God, or a day is like a thousand years. Time is not a time is not a God thing. In the mind of God, He sees it happening. 
You see, in the mind of God, He still sees the, the foundation of the world. God sees the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God sees the whole picture. So to God, 2,000 years may just be a, a short time. And couldn't this be the beginning of the end times? Oh, yeah. When he was given that revelation. Oh, exactly. I'm pretty sure that's when things started ticking. Exactly. At least in the mind of God, God says, this is coming, and it's quicker than you think it is. It's, it's not as far as you think it is. So in other words, yeah, I don't, compared to the 6,000 years at least that we have recorded of man, yeah. 6,000 years, at least the way God was looking at it, hey, time's at hand. I, I, this is coming. Be ready. I don't want you to seal this up. I want people to read this. I want people to know what's coming and to be aware of it. The Bible says we should recognize the signs of the last days. We are ready. We definitely in some of them. Paul wrote about them to Timothy, didn't he? What the last days would be like. Number two, let's look at the second thing in your outline, the finished work of Christ. He says in beginning in verse 12, uh, the, the significant, significance, if you will, Verses 11 through 16, kind of this finished work of God. In verse 12, he says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Here we see the Lord coming back, and I love how he says that when I come, my reward will be with me. I'm coming to recognize those who have chosen to follow me. Um, the beginning work of redemption began all the way back in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Maybe I'll let him bring my stuff. That's the second time he mentioned Oh, has it? Alright. I didn't bring my, my charger over here. Verse 11 settles what we are. When I say that, on the cross, Jesus separated two thieves and and uh, he he talked about those thieves. He said the one on the left and one on the right, the importance of them coming to faith and they're coming to trust God, to believe God. And we know one did and one didn't. And God's always dealt with who we are. We're born as children of wrath in need of a Savior. Some will make that right decision. Some will not make that right decision. Some will go their own way. But the decisions we make, the decisions we make. When Jesus comes back, He's putting this whole thing to rest. I think of the finished work of Christ. I think it, the person's life choices are um, define who we are. They define who we are by the choices we make in this life. How many young people do you know that are messed up today because of some bad choices they made in young people? How many older folks today that you know are really they're, they're living through the consequences? of bad choices. And we've all made bad choices, haven't we? Some maybe more than others. He says in here that we could go on being wicked for eternity. Full of hate. Full of bitterness. Did you quit on me? Alright. Um, I'll just give you the answers for the last ones here. Y'all don't pay you blank people, don't pay. I'll give you the answers. All right. <laughs> The righteous are going on being righteous in eternity. That's what he means when he says of that verse in verse uh, 11 there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse... Uh, yeah. Okay, verse 11. Thank y'all. I'm just... My eyes should have brought my extra set of eyes with me today. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He's talking about if you make that choice to live that life of wickedness, you're going to live that for all eternity. And the consequences of that. You ever hear anybody say, well, I don't care if I go to hell, all my friends will be there. <laughs> How do we respond to that? I heard that a lot. From some smart aleck. You know? All my friends will be there. Well, you won't know them. They have no idea what they're going to wake up. To. One of the characteristics of hell is it's a place of loneliness mm. and a place of darkness mm. as well as a place of torment. Yeah. A place where the worm never dies. Mm. Let me tell you something. 
I don't like worms. But I'm gonna tell you something. I was afraid there might be some snakes there. So I just I made it right on early on because I didn't want a chance there being no snakes. I don't like snakes. Me and snakes don't get along. No, I hadn't yet. <laughs> yet. Of course I ain't got that couch no more, but anyway. Eddie sent me something the other day about a man finding a big old, what, eight foot long yeah. snake in his couch. Yeah. Oh, Dude, where's he live? 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 Over in Mozambique or something? <laughs> Dude, that's about the same thing. About the same thing. So, I got a question. Okay. So the the wicked's gonna be wicked, and yeah, we're suffering our consequences. I do it daily. Um, you get a chance to, I mean, like the redemption, though, you know. Well, yeah, you have that chance now, but you don't get it after you die. That's what he's in reference to. He's saying those who made the choice of wickedness right. are going to be wicked forever in hell. Now they have a chance to re repent. They're already gone, though, right? Well, where he's talking about here, yeah, it's people who've already made that decision. I mean, that decision's already been settled. He's just talking about eternity now. Gotcha. So he's saying, quit worrying about it. Yeah. Well, he's just basically saying the saved, the, the, the righteous, are going to live with righteousness. Right. The wicked are going to live with wickedness. Can you imagine living with wickedness today? Let's say you live in a part of town and everybody hates each other and they drive by shootings and they, they break you. <laughs> you do live there? Okay. I thought all y'all done moved out of Baltimore. I got a bunch of Balkanville graduates that go to church here. They graduated out. <laughs> I, say, I say that joking to y'all. I'm an old Balkanville boy. I, I, all my relatives live there. He has the right. It's kind of like I'm fat, so I'm talking about fat You're right. I married a woman from Baltimore, and she's got all her teeth. <laughs> yeah, what'd you tell me the name of that store she's bought them from? Yeah. They fell out, they glued them all back in or something, right? <laughs> yeah, I went to school with her brother. Believe me, I know them people. I know them Del Rios. Okay, so we're back on the screen. Thanks for the waving. So, when the Lord comes back, one of the things when this, I say the finished work of Christ on here, because when we read about this, he's talking about what's finished. Listen, folks, there's not another chance after after the judgment, after the great white throne of judgment, which we talked about a little earlier. There's not another chance after you die. First of all, what Jesus did on the cross finished it all, paid for the sin debt. All you have to do is reach out and take it. You have to reach out and receive it. But if you choose, wickedness. You'll be wicked forever. You'll live in the midst of the most wicked. I can't imagine living somewhere where at night I was I was afraid who was going to be breaking in the window. I, just, uh, I couldn't sleep because I was worried about what window was going to be breaking, who was trying to break in. I was worried about who was going to shoot at you when you walked outside. I mean, that's kind of what yeah. that's the type of fear we think of when we think of hell and wickedness. The next thing I want to quickly get on down the line here is tell us where we are. The finished work of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, and when he returns, it settles where we are. In verses 12 to 15, he talked about all of that. He says, my reward is with me. I'm going to give it to everyone according to his work. I love the verse. I use it in funerals a whole lot, where it says, how it, over in Psalms it says, it's precious it is in the sight of the Lord, death of one of his saints. Amen. And in that verse here in Revelation, it says, uh, talks about how does it say uh, uh, rest from your labors and your work shall follow you. In other words, you're going to stand before God one day and receive your rewards from God. You're going to be rewarded by Him. So, so the way the choices you make here on this earth, your your works, the things that you, the choices you've made in this life, they follow you to God. And He said, I bring those rewards with me. I'm ready. 
Don't think what you've done. Don't think the choices you've made are going to be forgotten. Have you ever made a choice for God that cost you something? Yep. Who said that? Okay. You know, you remember one time King David wanted some water and somebody ran a long ways and got him some water and they came back to him and they said, Here, King, he poured it out on the ground. He said, Then go get me another cup. And they said, Why'd you do that? He said, because I'm not going to give anything to God. He had prayed over that. I don't, I don't remember exactly the whole story, but he said basically this. I'm not going to give anything to God that doesn't cost me something. I'm willing to be thirsty a little longer. You know, folks, there's things that we want to give God. It needs to cost us. Sometimes it costs us to be different from the world. You may do without some things. You may, you may live without some things. You, you may not have that big old house you'd like to have. You may... I remember when my kids were in school, I, I drove a 14, 15 year old pickup, about like I do now. You know, and I had, the church paid me well, I could have got another one, but you know what I was doing? I was buying my kids vehicles. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. I was buying them new vehicles or decent vehicles so they could drive around. And, and then I spent money, I put them in a Christian school. I believe that's important. You may not, but I, I, I wanted mine in a good Christian environment. And it was a Baptist Christian school over in Georgia. And I started a Christian school. Uh, I, I, just, I just believe in Christian education. But I'm just saying, sometimes things that I did for my children to grow up, to learn of God, to know of God, it costs you something sometimes. Decisions you make may cause you to be unliked and unloved. May get you not very popular, kicked out of the groups that you'd like to hang out with. But things that we give God are going to cost us something. Sometimes we think, well, I'm just going to go to church, but I ain't going to let it cost me nothing. Well, tithing will cost you something. You'll do without some things, maybe to be able to tithe. But, but when we look at these verses here, Paul says that, that uh, he was willing to depart to go be with Christ. Because he knew, man, putting his life in God's hands for eternity was a good thing. Jesus is, uh, gives us a promise here to his followers. Always know that he's aware. When I think about his reward being with us, he's aware of everything we do. <coughs> There's things that you'll do for somebody. It may be give somebody a hundred dollars to go pay their light bill, or give somebody a hundred dollars to go to go get some groceries. Nobody knows about it but you. Okay, those are the things that God blesses. The Bible says when we give anonymously, so the right hand doesn't know what the left hand does. We don't do it for, for a pat on the back. The only one that needs to know about is God. And believe me, when He shows up with the sack of rewards, He made a note. Of it. How about this? When you go work in the nursery and you really wanted to stay in church, you really wanted to hear the sermon, you really wanted to sit with your friends, but you say, I'll go take a turn. That's a pretty big sacrifice. It's a big sacrifice, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't want to do it. Because you get one day a week and you say, I'll come to church. I want to go hear Brother Mike right. preach and I want to hear the music service and I want to hear the... But if we all have that attitude, we just bring all the children and the crying babies into the sanctuary. Yeah. And then nobody gets to hear what they want. We don't think about that little thing being a big sacrifice, do we? But that's a sacrifice. Help with children's church. Sing in the choir. God forbid, I'd have to come up here at 5 o'clock and practice. Sing in the choir. What's well, sacrifice? Are the Hello? ones that get here early to get all the food ready. Yeah, the ones that come early. Prepare a meal on Wednesday night. Think about what you're giving God in this time of reward. Well, I, I need to quickly move on through this. I don't even know what time it is. Time's up. Time's up. 730. Time to quit. It settles whose we are. Yeah. The, the last one, C. It settles whose we are. Who we belong to. No. W-H-O-S-E. Who we belong to. 
Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angels and testified to you these things in the churches. I'm the root, the offspring of David. That's what Jesus wants us to know, isn't he? Well, when he talks about the root and the offspring of David, I mean, he's jumping way back over in the Old Testament. That's what he's talking about. That's who he is. All right, look at the last one. Our time is gone. The final witness of the Spirit. The last welcome of the Bible says, Come. Let the Spirit and the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Verse 17. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever did not desires to him take the water of life free to come. There's probably not a sweeter word in the whole Bible than when God says, Come. You go all the way back to the ark. They built. And God was inside that ark, and God said to Noah and his family, and said, Come. Not go. And go is not what you want to hear. No. Well, it's like God saying, go do something I'm not doing, but God's inviting us to come be with Him. That's a beautiful thing. Every Sunday we give an invitation, it's God saying, come. It's not me saying it. It's God saying, come. And that's what we see here. The last welcome. The last warning. The last warning. He said, don't change this book. I testify to you the words of prophecies of this book. If anyone adds these things, God will give him the plagues that are written in, his book, in this book, and anyone takes away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. In other words, kind of that emphasis there of being blotted out of the book again, isn't it? Like we talked about earlier. And that's not talking about losing your salvation. Let me make that real clear. Yeah. He's talking about you were in the book of the living, and there could come a point when God says, you're no longer in the book of life. You come out. In other words, you're not going to heaven because you didn't trust Christ. Not that you had Christ and then you lost him, but you never trusted Christ. When you die without Christ, you come out of the book. Or here he's saying, you do some things like this, you may find yourself coming out of the book. Yeah. All right? Uh, the last warning and then the last word. I'm sorry, I'm just bumping through this. The last word. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Even so, Lord, come quickly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He who testifies of these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. I don't know about you, but I maybe could have seen old John sitting there saying, Ooh, Lord, that's a mouthful. I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for all that. Mm. Lord, but he didn't. He just said, Lord, come on quickly. Come on. Yeah. Don't wait. Come on. And so that's just an invitation there for God to, to, to win. It's an invitation for God to shut up all this nonsense we hear in our world today that is so anti-God. Studying facts recently, 75% of, of Europe today is involved in some way in the occult. 75%. It's amazing how our world is changing. All right, let's uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the night to be here and study together and finish our study of Revelation. And, and God, we look at this and the the hardships of the world and the the enemy always trying to trip us up and bring us down, Lord. And we're reminded that you're faithful and God that that you tell us in Romans. 828, that all things work together for good. Those who love you, it's called according to your purpose. So, Lord, we just claim that promise. And, God, we look at a world that's disintegrating, and we say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. God, redeem this old world. It groans to be delivered. Redeem your people, Lord. Take them away out of the presence of sin and the, away from the power of sin. God, that we may dwell in your presence forever. What a great day that will be, Lord. So we say, come quickly. It's in Jesus' name we pray.